Hello and welcome to Inside Business with Kieran Hancock, a podcast from the Irish Times. This week I'll be putting the state's finances under the microscope with Cliff Taylor of the Irish Times, following the publication of first quarter exchequer returns on Tuesday. And later in the show, I'll be talking to our resident aviation expert, Barry Hallowen, about Ryanair's traffic numbers for March and the outlook for air travel for the rest of this year. But I'll start with the state's first quarter exchequer returns. For this part of the show, I was joined by Cliff Taylor of the Irish Times. Now, Cliff Taylor, welcome back to Inside Business. We had exchequer figures yesterday for the first quarter of this year. Some interesting numbers in there. There was a, a 4.2 billion euro deficit, which we shouldn't be surprised about given the current lockdown restrictions. But tax receipts were actually up 1% and the VAT numbers, very strong, up 8% or 350 million euros, in spite of the fact that non-essential retail right around the country is currently locked down. How do you square that circle? Yeah, there's a lot bouncing around and a lot going on in those figures. And I think um, some comparisons with last year, which are messed up by uh, by, the, by the pandemic starting and by uh, measures that were taken at the start of this pandemic in terms of uh, giving people leeway on paying their taxes. But as you say, uh, remarkably strong uh, overall performance by tax. Uh, even if you look back at 2019 and take all the pandemic uh take all the pandemic uh, factors out of it uh, from last year. Taxes in the first quarter this year were a couple of percent higher than the first quarter of 2019, uh, with particularly strong growth in income tax up 18% and corporation tax up 11%. Now, I guess the, the caveat there is if, if, you, if you look back the two years, VAT is down 10%. So there is uh, uh, you know, some, uh, some difficulty with the year-on-year comparison, and that possibly is, is a better way to look at it. And, and not surprising, as you say, given that uh, half the retail sector is closed at this stage. That said, uh, you would have expected, I think, that VAT w- could be down a bit more at this stage. And uh, the Minister for Finance, Pascal Dunham, who made the point that uh, consumers are starting to adapt. They're getting more used to buying online uh, and that is supporting revenues to some extent. So so all in all, a reasonable set of figures. I, I think if you look at the other side of the, the ledger, the, the spending side, uh, you see spending up a, a whopping 14% uh, and, and by more, by over 20% on the same period in 2019. Massive additional spending in social welfare, as we know, on the pandemic unemployment payment, also on wage subsidies, also on, on, on supports. So there is a huge wedge of extra money that's gone into the economy to uh, to try to deal with the pandemic. And I think one of the questions now over the next year is what happens when that money starts to be withdrawn. Uh, you know, can the, can the economy restart uh, or what part of the economy can restart without, without those supports and, and, and what's the picture going to look like? The minister, the two ministers, uh, Michael McGrath and Pascal Dunn, who are, are, are killed telling us that there won't be any cliff edge, that the supports won't be withdrawn suddenly. Uh, and I'm sure they won't, but withdrawn they will be, you know, over the next year or so. And, uh, that is going to be it. That is going to be a test for for all parts of the economy. I think. Yeah, you mentioned spending on a rolling basis, twelve months. It was up eighteen billion euros, and I'm just wondering, Cliff, how much of that extra spending is now effectively embedded into the system? Uh, for example, extra healthcare spending, and how much of it, you know, are we simply going to be able to uh, uh, with, withdraw or scrub out? If you like, obviously the PUP payments, as people go back to work, they'll come off those. So that'll disappear. But a lot of it is embedded as well, isn't it? Yeah, uh, there's a bit of, I suppose, a third secret of Fatima in terms of that, in terms of the Department of Finance and their estimates. Now, they will be producing their stability program update over the next couple of weeks, which is going to give some indication uh, of how they expect the deficit to move over the next few years and, and will, I suppose, go some way to answering your question of, how much of the spending is is one off, and how much of it is going to repeat? Uh, the best guide we have is looking at the fiscal advisory council from earlier this year, when they they looked at the numbers. They reckon that uh, five billion of the additional spending in the budget this year uh, is is effectively spending that will will repeat, as you say, areas like health, education, uh, some areas of welfare. Uh, money that we're going to have to find, you know, some way to pay for in in the next few years, and I suppose you know that's the first bit of the question in terms of uh, how, how the exchequer finances are going to look over the next couple of years. The second bit of it is how growth is going to go and what that's going to mean for taxes uh, and for spending. Um, you know, the ministers of we would all hope, I guess, for a strong rebound in the economy as it reopens. 
Um, you'd have to reckon we're likely to see that, assuming assuming it can be reopened successfully. But we all know the questions. Some sectors will remain subject to restrictions. Uh, we just don't know how this is going to go over the next few months. We hope the vaccinations are you know are going to change the picture, and that by you know by summer the the bulk of the economy, if not all of it, will be will be operating at something that feels a bit more like normality, even though it's you know there will be sectors still subject to restrictions and some sectors, you know, like events and, and overseas travel with, I think, big question marks over them uh, over the next year or so. Yeah, now we did have some forecasts from the IMF yesterday around uh, global growth. They've upgraded their forecast for this year from 55 to 6%. And they've suggested that the big advanced economies really aren't, are going to see very little impact from COVID because of the vaccine rollout program, the speed of those programs, I guess, particularly in the likes of the UK and the US, um, but also because of the fiscal supports that have been put behind economies. Yeah, I mean, there's no doubt that the international indicators have been better in the first few months of this year than than, than people had expected. And the scale in particular of the fiscal expansion planned in the US and, and being undertaken in the US and, and, and planned for the future is is very striking. Uh, and, and these are the factors that are, are leading the IMF to uh, to push up their growth forecasts. You know, I, I guess we need to remember that that comes from a that follows a kind of a four percent fall in, in in global output last year. So, uh, the, to an extent, it's a bounce back, and we'll be a while getting back to where we were. I do think there's a question mark over that assertion that uh, you know th- there won't be much long term pain in in the major advanced economies. There's been such a, a hit to kind of specific consumer face sectors it's gone on for so long now uh, a lot of the SME sect- sectors are, are, are going to be struggling and I think unemployment is going to be significantly higher for, for, for a period of time so I, I think you know let's hope the IMF is right and that the scars aren't too deep but I think that's still, that one still has a way to run to be honest with you I don't know if they were including Ireland in that assessment does Ireland qualify as a big advanced economy? No, I guess it doesn't. But uh, I suppose at the same time, we would, we might be expected to uh, to perform, you know, uh, kind of as an industrialized economy along you know, something something similar to the to, to the bigger economies. I mean, there are. I mean, it's been said it's been said a lot now, but the extraordinary thing, and this goes back to the tax figures as well, is the is the split in the Irish economy between the. I suppose what you might call the multinational dominated sector and the SME sector. I mean, we saw during the financial crisis that basically the whole of the economy was was hit. Obviously, some bits some bits like construction were hit a lot harder than others, but we went into a recession where you know everyone pretty much everyone was worse off, or most people were worse off. Uh, most sectors suffered. Uh, you know, pay was cut or stalled across the board. This time, it's it's so far anyway. It's really been um, the consumer facing sectors that have suffered, and the other ones. The other sectors, uh, the multinational dominated sectors, haven't just held in. Some of them have actually made ground over the last year. You know, the pharma sector and the tech sector being the two, uh, the two most obvious examples. Hiring more people, paying the people they have more, and there's no doubt that's been a really significant support for the economy. And you know, there's no reason why that shouldn't continue over the next couple of years. Y- you might have some concerns about how the fallout from the withdrawal of supports might affect some other sectors, you know, the banking sector, for example, which is going to be grappling with more bad debts. Uh, and there could be, you know, something of a spreading, I guess, of, of the impact of that over the next couple of years. But we, looking at the multinational, the export dominated sectors, they, 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 there's no reason really to think that they aren't set fair for the next couple of years. Cliff, as you see it at the moment, what's the prospect for the air travel sector in Ireland, uh, particularly as the vaccine rollout program kind of accelerates in the, in the coming months? When do you think it might begin to get back on its feet? Do you have any easy questions, Kieran? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, 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 it's a stick your finger in the air to some extent. And we've seen looking at the UK, which is probably six or seven weeks ahead of us in terms of vaccination, how they've been coming and going on this. There were indications that people were going to be able to travel. Then they drew back on that. Now they seem to be going back to some extent, to hoping people might be able able to travel a bit with some with some kind of vaccine passports, uh, I I think the variants have really complicated this issue uh, for Ireland, and you would think that the outlook for this summer for people travelling overseas there would be very much a question mark over that. Is there a possibility that there may be agreement with some other some other countries that vaccinated people uh, can travel some of the European countries? 
uh, for example. Yeah, it, it, it is possible. Uh, but I think the return of anything that we might think of as normal in terms of air travel is still, you know, is still very, very, very shrouded. And I think you'd still be looking at next year before you would hope for any kind of return to normality. I mean, for example, big questions over tourism from America, uh, which is traditionally one of our biggest markets, uh, and even tourism from the UK. But as people are vaccinated, this could change and, and you know, the picture could, 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 could look significantly better uh, come summer if, um, if the variants are, are, are kept it's roughly under some kind of control. Also a significant week, Cliff, potentially at least in terms of finding an agreement on this issue, thorny issue of global corporate tax. Uh, the US Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen on Monday made a speech in Chicago where she called on other countries to support the US's move for a global minimum uh, level of corporation tax to be imposed upon multinationals. And at the IMF meeting, it looks as if France and Germany and possibly the UK have rode in behind that call, albeit with some conditions attached. And Pascal Dunn, who did say yesterday uh, at the announcement of the exchequer figures that change is coming in, in terms of corporate tax. So how do you see it? How significant uh, a move has it been over the past couple of days, Cliff? Yeah, I think what's happened has been very significant. So. I mean, first of all, we had um, Joe Biden saying uh, that he wanted to see a 21% minimum tax rate of, charged on US companies and the worldwide earnings of US companies. And sure, everyone is saying, you know, that this still has to go through Congress and it does and that it can be amended. And, you know, that is probably quite likely. But still, when the most, you know, one of the most powerful economies in the world sets its stall towards a 21% minimum rate for its companies and, and our rate is 12.5%, then that is significant. And, you know, there is a prospect of the companies here uh, might have to pay the Irish rate and then, you know, pay a top-up rate or whatever in the US if, if, if that's the way the thing goes. Now, having said that, it's, I, I guess, no surprise that the US is also supporting a global minimum tax at, at, at these OECD talks. Still a long way to play out in that. Uh, there's still a lot of horse trading and still, I, I guess, a you know significant lack of clarity on what the rate of that tax might be. Uh, the original expectation was that it might head to twelve and a half percent, which is around the Irish rate, which is the Irish rate, which which would have suited us okay. Uh, would have meant some changes for us, but wouldn't have been a a, a big uh, change for Ireland. Uh, but if the rate is set at a higher level globally, uh, then Ireland does face you know some fundamental questions. Uh, one of them is whether to increase our own rate or not. So, for example, if the global rate is set at 15%, it wouldn't seem much point in keeping our rate at 12.5%, uh, although there still is a, a, a long way to play out before that happens. So two things, I think, in play for Ireland over the coming months, uh, and this is kind of likely to be tied up by the, by the summer, you know, or tied up or, 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 or fail by the summer, if you like. Uh, one is some potential hit to tax revenues by um, this idea of a digital sales tax, companies paying tax in markets where they sell uh, products. So big multinationals based in Ireland selling to France, Germany, the UK would pay some taxes in those markets rather than paying all their European taxes in Ireland. So that, that's been estimated by the Department of Finance to cost Ireland up to 2 billion euro a year out of, out of 12, billion, 12 billion in uh, corporate taxes. So significant enough hit. But I think the bigger issue is what it means for our model of attracting companies here, how this minimum tax rate thing is going to play out. You know, on, on the one side, OK, just looking looking at things as they are now, if we, if we were to increase our corporate tax rate, you know, maybe we might get extra revenue. But on the flip side, if this hits our competitiveness in terms of attracting firms here, then that may reduce the level of activity in Ireland, reduce the future investment in Ireland in some sectors anyway. So it's very complicated to see where the balance might be, but I but I think there's there are certainly dangers here for the Irish model and, and some tricky questions potentially for us over the next few months. I think it's fair to say, Cliff, that the Trump administration didn't really engage fully with the OECD on this issue around global taxation. They certainly weren't uh, wedded to the idea of uh, US multinationals being taxed um, by the likes of France or Germany or wherever in terms of their um, digital sales. 
And we, I, I guess the narrative in the election was that a Biden administration would be good for Ireland. And yet here we have very early in, in the Biden administration's lifetime, we have a very decisive move on global corporation tax, which could undermine the Irish sacred cow of 12.5% corporate tax rate. So in the fullness of time, might we look back, do you think, on Joe Biden being elected as president as actually a bad thing for Ireland? He doesn't seem to be wearing a green jersey at the moment. Yeah, I, I mean, I think uh, anyone who read his uh, campaign literature, you know, would not be entirely surprised by what happened, even if the, 20, the 21 percent rate or the, the, the height of the 21 percent rate maybe came as a bit of surprise. But, you know, we, we I guess we thought that the America first um uh, message, you know, was 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 basically a Trump message and 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 bringing investment back home and and all the talk we heard from him about it. Uh, but I think it it's more than that. It reflects kind of a deeper mood in America and just as Donald Trump did, Joe Biden is playing into the politics of this. That there's a large uh, American working and middle class who haven't done particularly well over the last few years, uh, and you know who who are looking for change. And he's this massive investment program uh, that he's come forward with. And he needs to find a way to help pay for it. And hitting large companies is seen as a popular way to do it. And if you can dress that up to some extent or or, or make that to some extent uh, an attack on tax havens and attack on, an attack on companies avoiding tax by using these clever structures, then, you know, all the better from a political point of view. So I think... The mood music has really changed fundamentally, as you say, o- o- over the last few months since uh, since Biden came in. Uh, his campaign literature was very strong in terms of attracting investment back to Ireland, back to uh, the US in sectors like pharma, which would be a particular strength for Ireland. Uh, and, and I think you know there, there there is an issue there in terms of the amount of pharma pro- high value pharma products that are manufactured in Ireland and sent back to the US market. So most of the big multinationals in, in Ireland would be serving European markets. Uh, but I think there's particular sensitivity uh, and perhaps exposure in the ones that are that are serving back to the to the US market. So, yeah, I think the game is going to it, it looks like the game is going to change over the next few years. Uh, it looks like the US will will push ahead with this global minimum uh, tax. Will it be 21 percent? I don't know. Uh, there is some opposition in Congress. Uh, some concerns in Congress about the impact on business and jobs. So we'll just have to, th- to see the way that plays out. Uh, but I think the direction of travel is very clear, and that is uh, higher taxes on business and a really significant clampdown on uh, the use of aggressive tax structures. Uh, and I think that is, you know, it is something that is going to affect the investment picture here fundamentally over o- over coming years. Cliff, finally, let's just go back to the Irish economy and talk about the reopening plans. You're somebody who has your ear pressed to the door of the Department of Finance. What do you think, uh, how do you see this rollout uh, working? When do you think, for example, the hospitality industry is going to be allowed open up again? When do you think wet pubs uh, might be allowed? When When do you think we might see spectators at outdoor events again? Yeah, it's... it's, uh, it's Slow, slow, not not even slow, slow, quick, 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 slow. It's slow, 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 slow at the moment, I think. Um, look, I think we'll, assuming the figures stay roughly where they are, and, and you know, who knows on that, uh, might we see the retail sector reopen over the next, you know, d- during May? I think I think that, that has to happen. That's likely to happen, uh, particularly in the context of people being allowed to travel a further distance from their home. Maybe there'll be some... Um, phasing in via click and collect or whatever but you know it's unless things go off track it's you would expect the retail sector to uh, to be back in action in, in in may i think the really tricky one is the is the one you've put your finger on there uh, which is the hospitality sector and the different bits of that sector if you look at what happened in the uk they opened up um, self-catering accommodation first for example and outdoor dining and then they're going through a, a process like that and uh, maybe something similar will happen here but the real marker, I think, is the end of June. And, and can the hotels uh, and the holiday sector be, got, be gotten open by the end of June in the context of people being allowed to travel across the, across the country? Um, because if that can't happen, I think the, uh, you know, the, summer sec- the summer season is, is effectively gone. Now, if you look at where the vaccination campaign will be by then, you know, we should be heading up towards the kind of levels that have allowed um, Israel, which is which is the furthest ahead, to, to open up 
fairly significantly we're having, we're having cases falling. So, you know, given a fair wind on the vaccination, you, you would hope to see the hospitality sector open open for July. Um, wet pubs, I don't know. Uh, you would think they're going to come later. And I know the restaurant sector is very worried about when indoor dining will be allowed. And obviously with this more uh, transmissible variant, uh, that is, I guess, one of the more difficult questions the government faces. And that's, that, that's a hard one to answer. But then you get anomalies. For example, if people are traveling to uh, visit hotels and hotel restaurants are open, then why shouldn't, uh, why shouldn't independent restaurants be allowed open? So I think, I think a bit to play out in that one yet. But if the vaccination campaign does roll out as expected and we don't get any really nasty surprise from, uh, from new variants, well, then hopefully, hopefully for the summer we'll see hospitality open and, and, and a reasonable reopening of society, albeit with masks and restrictions and distancing, I think, continuing for some time yet. OK, well, let's hope you're right on that one, Cliff. Uh, Cliff Taylor of the Irish Times, illuminating as always. Thank you for joining Inside Business. In the next part of the show, I spoke with Barry O'Halloran of the Irish Times about the outlook for air travel this year. I began by asking Barry about Ryanair's passenger numbers for March and how the rest of the year is shaping up for Europe's largest budget airline. You're listening to the Irish Times. Now, Barry Halloran, welcome to Inside Business. Ryanair had passenger numbers for March out yesterday and they showed that 500,000 people travelled with the airline during the month. That was down from 5.5 million people a year earlier, which, of course, was the beginning of the pandemic in Europe. So that was a drop of 91%. Um, Barry, a steep drop, obviously, uh, not entirely unexpected. But just wondering what the airline is saying about the future uh, for air travel for the rest of this year. Yeah, well, Kiran, they are talking about uh, returning to in and around 80% of capacity by the summer. A number of weeks before they released those passenger figures yesterday, Michael O'Leary said that Ryanair expects to be flying in and around 2,300 flights a week, uh, which they said was about 80% of normal capacity by the summer. Now, they, they said the summer, they didn't put a a precise point and it isn't as in we will we will begin flying 80 percent of capacity on the first of june or anything of that nature so the airline seems relatively optimistic about its um about its prospects for the coming year and it is also uh, as of this morning they've updated passenger predictions as well and they are looking at i think somewhere in the order of Uh, 80 million to 120 million passengers for their current financial year, which began at the start of this month. Uh, That would be almost, if they hit 120 million, that would be close to four times the total. In fact, it would be more than four times the total for their last financial year, which was just 27.5 million. Yeah, and obviously a lot of optimism there, but there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of question marks over that optimism and over those figures, right? Because if you take in Ireland, for example, we're having this debate about hotel quarantine and whether people should be allowed to travel into the country at all, regardless of where they're coming from. If you look at France, they have this new uh, COVID variant, uh, which everybody's worried about. And, and France is in another uh, lockdown. And across Europe, um, there are lockdowns of, uh, of various descriptions. And even in Britain, where the vaccine uh, program is, is probably at its most advanced in terms of Europe, um, they're sort of wrestling with when they should encourage people to go back uh, traveling internationally again, because there is this fear that people will bring back a variant of some sort or another with them. So 120 million, I mean, if they, if they hit that number, it would be extraordinary, wouldn't it? It would be extraordinary. But the bottom line is they certainly have the capacity to do that. And they're, they're beginning to take on extra aircraft this year. So, uh, and Ryanair has historically been able to move very quickly to, to ramp up and ramp down operations in, very pla- in, in various places. So at the practical side, certainly I think it's within Ryanair's capability of getting somewhere close to that 80 to 120 million figure. The one thing they can't control really is the vaccine program and, um, and uh, the, the pace at which national governments, as you've pointed out, are willing to reopen. Even uh, last year, before we had vaccines, Ryanair did at one point manage to get to 60% of capacity uh, during the summer, albeit not for terribly long. So with that in mind, if everything goes according to plan, I could certainly see them hitting 80% of vaccine towards the, or 80% of capacity rather, towards the end of summer. 
if there is a fair wind, if the Republic and if the EU manage to get a fair wind behind their respective vaccine programmes. If not, then, yeah, I think it would be a challenge. Yeah, I'm sure the government would disagree with you, Barry, uh, to say that they don't have a plan in place in terms of the vaccine rollout. But anyway, we'll we'll, we'll move on. Um, do we know where Aer, Aer Lingus is at in terms of its uh, plan to to reopen and, and to ramp up capacity? Well, what, where the, what Aer Lingus has been saying, and in fact, they've been saying this really since um, late last year, the beginning of this year, is that they have been selling a summer schedule. And that is in, that is in fact the case. But they've been keeping it under review in light of the various lockdowns and the various developments, such as the the, uh, the rather draconian quarantine programs that ourselves and a lot of European company, countries um, are operating. The, it, Aer Lingus is in a slightly different ballpark to Ryanair as well, in that Aer Lingus's business for the last sort of five, six years up to COVID-19 or up to the, the, the arrival of COVID-19, was very much focused on growing its transatlantic business and where that will be or, you know, when that comes back, that's that's a six million dollar question, I think, for the airline. Other than that, it, it could, like Ryanair, develop a reasonably healthy um, European business at some point in the, the sort of second half of this year, should all those vaccine programs, once again, once again should all those vaccine programs around the continent um, actually get up to speed and should we get, you know, decent numbers of people vaccinated? Yeah, Barry, I'm just wondering, where where's the rest of the Irish aviation industry at? I mean, in terms of, let's say, our airports, how have they weathered the storm of the pandemic and how ready are they to ramp up, uh, you know, as things begin to open up again? And also uh, a couple of other Irish airlines or airlines based out of Ireland, like Stobart and CityJet, for example, how are they fixed at the minute? Well, in terms of the airports, DAA has lost in the region of 2,000 workers are either in the process of taking or will take voluntary redundancy. They have certainly reordered their business. They've cut it to, to, cut it to size or cut it to match what size they think it will be. The picture is very much the same in Shannon. We have at this stage around 3% of normal passenger numbers walking through, you know, passing through our airports throughout 2019, the daily average, the, about 104,000 people pass through Irish airports. That's all Irish airports taken together every day. That figure is now down around 3,000 a day. So the, in effect, there, there is really nobody arriving here at all. Um, and there is very little business being done in our airports as a consequence. However, DAA has um returned uh, most of its workforce to their full pre-COVID um, pay as of the end of last month. Um, and they're certainly, well, I wouldn't say optimistic, but certainly they're, they are ready and waiting for when things start to, to um, they're, they're certainly ready and waiting for when things start to roll back, yeah, or for when the, the crisis starts to recede, rather. Sure. Um, what's Michael O'Leary's view on this whole idea of vaccine passports which may or may not allow um, people who've been vaccinated with one or two doses uh, uh, to to travel abroad as opposed to uh, those who haven't been vaccinated? Well, what Ryanair has said is that they won't stop people who haven't been vaccinated from getting on their planes. In one sense, that's academic because the, the vaccine passports are going to be agreed by countries and by the EU overall. So uh, presumably, if someone can't hasn't been vaccinated and doesn't have a vaccine passport, there isn't much... Uh, point in them attempting to fly in the first place. So from that point of view, Ryanair or any other airlines kind of view on vaccine passports is a little bit academic because governments are going to determine how that works. Yeah. And any sense, Barry, when the air travel industry might get back on its feet? I mean, we've had lots of predictions about how long this might last, the disruption that, you know, it could be two years, four years, five years, seven years, uh, etc. What, what are you hearing from the people in the industry? I think the basic notion that... Um, you're looking at 24, 2024, 2025 um, for it to have recovered, you know, a full full semblance of normality. It may not be quite back to 2019 levels, but it will be getting there. I think that's what most people feel at this stage. And I think those are reasonable predictions. But that really is down to, you know, how fast it begins to recover in the first place and how fast it begins to uh, to get momentum, if you like, and much of that really is down to um, the speed and efficiency of um, 
national and EU vaccine programmes. OK, Barry Holland, we'll leave it there. Uh, thank you for joining Inside Business. OK, that's it for this week from Inside Business. My thanks to Cliff Taylor and Barry Holland. This week's show was produced by Declan Conlon. You can get the latest business news straight into your inbox by signing up to our Business Today email at irishtimes.com. And you can also follow the Irish Times business feed on Twitter, LinkedIn and Facebook each day. I'm Kieran Hancock. Until next time, take care and stay safe. Music.